Okay. So last time uh, we went through uh, the problem of how to test if a point is contained inside a convex polytope. Uh, and we saw that that problem could be reduced to linear programming. In fact, it was actually equivalent to it in some sense. Uh, and there was this dual problem of finding uh, whether or not a polytope is contained in a half space. And again, that could also be solved using linear programming. And so today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a slight generalization of linear programming and go through a couple of other problems that we can solve using linear programming, or this small generalized version of it. Um, and then talk about a couple of other algorithms for solving it. So if you recall, last time we saw two interesting algorithms, not excluding trivial things like fourier moskin elimination or brute force, uh, which would include um, the simplex method, which uh, is more practical in higher dimensions, and uh, this other technique called Seidel's algorithm, which is linear in the number of constraints, but has a running time that's factorial in the dimension. So that's worse than exponential. So today, we'll see a couple of other algorithms which also realize this linear scaling in the number of constraints and have uh, super polynomial uh, growth in the dimension, but they're better than factorial growth. So they'll be you know, maybe like some sort of exponent, but uh, maybe not like de factorial type uh, size. So uh, to start with, though, uh, I'm going to introduce a new concept which is a framework for talking about generalizations of linear programming. So uh, this will include all of the linear programming problems that we've seen before, plus a couple of new things. Right? So it's a, a combinatorial uh, type of structure. And it was proposed uh, somewhat after the algorithms, which I'm going to present today, were discovered. But it includes all of them as special cases within this larger framework. So. This is the idea, right? And the thing that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, actually, let me use a different color, because this doesn't show up as well in the video capture. Um, right. Yeah, this looks fine. Right. So these problems are called LP-type problems after linear programming, LP-type problems. All right. And LP-type problems are combinatorial analogs of linear programming. So they don't involve any real numbers or anything other than that. They're just sort of uh, uh, an algorithmic framework in which you can do computations like linear programming. And an LP-type problem is determined by a tuple of three different things. So first, we have, uh, so it's basically a tuple, uh, S, D, and F, where S is a finite set. We're going to think of S as basically being the constraints or the half spaces in the linear program. But they're really just you know, arbitrary elements in some set. Right? We have this set D, which is a totally ordered set. Uh, so we'll think of it as basically D, and we'll add some you know, uh, comparison. right? So it's just a set with a total order. And finally, we have this function f, which is a map from subsets of s to d. All right. So we'll think of this as being our uh, objective. So this would be the thing that we would be trying to minimize, maybe, or uh, like optimize subject to all of the constraints. But nowhere in here will we actually define these things as constraints. Instead, we're going to enforce some axioms on this algebraic structure that they will have to obey. All right, so uh, this has to satisfy the following two axioms. The first is that this function f 
must be monotonic. So we have this monotonicity. So what this basically means is that uh, if we have two subsets of S, then when we apply F to these things, the result uh, better be decreasing as well. So that should mean that F of A is less than or equal to F of B, which is less than or equal to if we apply it to the whole set. So OK, straightforward enough, right? So if we think of this uh, function f as something where we give it some collection of half spaces and then it solves the linear program on those half spaces, then this just means that if we add more constraints to a set, that the objective function should only get smaller, which is reasonable and consistent with linear programming. Um, the second axiom is locality. Uh, and this is a little trickier. So we'll say, again, if we have uh, a pair of sets you know, contained in S, right, then we'll say for all uh, x and S, if we add this x to one of the sets and it leaves the objective function fixed, then we could have added it to the other set, and it would leave it fixed. So the idea is that if we take you know, any parameter x and we stick it in a, and the objective function is invariant, then it better be invariant for the other one. So the idea is that we want uh, this function f to stabilize after some finite number of sets have been inserted into it. So if for all of these guys, f of a equals f of b equals f of a union x, then we're going to require uh, that f of a is equal to f of b union x. So that's the basic definition right there. So uh, the intuition here is that if at some point in time maybe we found our solution here, which is the intersection of some finite set of points, and so we have some other planes that happen to contain it, then if it's true that for any point that we add into the set A, it remains fixed, we could have also added it to the other set B. So if you've ever looked at uh, matroids, there's a similar sort of matroid exchange axiom that they have to satisfy. Um, but this is sort of the algebraic version of a linear program. right? And um, it turns out that there are a lot of problems which we can turn into this basic structure right here, or interpret in this way. And given this type of structure, uh, we can actually compute f of s, which is the goal of this whole exercise, very efficiently. So the general problem here, right? So the goal is typically to compute f of s. All right. That's the high level idea. So we'll think of f as being something where you give it a collection of constraints. It gives you the value of the objective function at that point. All right. So that's the, um, the high level idea right there. Now, OK, so let's try to understand how we can apply this to linear programming. Or actually, wait. No, first, let me introduce two terms that we're going to need to use uh, periodically here. And I don't have much space on the blackboard, so I'm going to erase a few things. So I'm going to erase these axioms. Does everyone have this like written down? OK. So. All right, so here are two useful definitions. Uh, the first is the concept of a basis, which is similar to the idea of a basis for a vector space or a generating set for an affine space or the uh, you know, vertices of a convex hull. Right? We're going to define it in pretty much the same way. Um, we'll say a basis of an LP 
type problem uh, is a set S or B contained in S. So uh, such that for all uh, B prime strictly contained in B, F of B prime is less than F of B. So this means that it strictly gets smaller. So the idea is that if I have some set B, and if I took out any element or for any subset, it better get tinier when I pull one of these elements out. So in this sense, B is a, a maximal uh, set. Uh, and from the concept of a basis for one of these LP type problems, we can also formulate a notion called the dimension, or it's actually the combinatorial dimension of the problem. Because in some cases, it doesn't always match up with the affine dimension. So the combinatorial, I'll put it in parentheses, don't, we'll omit combinatorial when it's obvious that we're talking about an LP type problem. Uh, dimension of an LP type problem is the maximum cardinality of a basis for the problem. So that's the idea. So if we basically start with some problem, and then we take the uh, maximum of any possible uh, basis set for it, then the number of elements in that set is the dimension of the LP type problem. Uh, so that's the basic idea. So here's another little convention is that generally, we'll set the cardinality of the whole set S. We'll call this parameter n, usually, keeping with you know, notation from before. And then the dimension, we'll set this equal to d, typically. And these will match up with our intuitions for linear programming. And uh, let's sort of work through that right now. So uh, OK, need to make more space here, so I'm going to erase. All right, everyone good? All right. So let's take a look at linear programming again from the perspective of LP type problems. So linear programming. as LP type problems. So here is the idea. So our set S is going to be equal to a collection of half spaces. Uh, D it's just going to be real numbers. All right. And then f is actually the linear program itself. So we'll think of f as equal to the uh, our f of some subset x of s is the min of all little x contained in x of some objective function c transpose x such that, uh, let's call these guys a sub i, right? a sub i transpose x is less than or equal to 0. Written in homogeneous coordinates, or we could actually like put a parameter there, b i, if we wanted to do it in affine coordinates. So that's the idea. So OK, 
Uh, what's the dimension of a linear program in this context? Um, well, we need to figure out what is the maximum number of half spaces that we could ever have involved in any solution. Um, so there is, uh, first of all, if we do have a solution, we know that it's going to occur at a vertex, right? But it might also be that the problem itself is infeasible. And so in some sense, one way we could think about solving one of these things or calculating the dimension is that we can look at the maximum number of constraints that we would need to check intersect as an empty set. All right, so we'll basically imagine that we have this whole collection of half spaces here. And if we can find some finite subset of them, which happen to be empty, then that would be enough to certify that the entire linear program has no solution. All right, so what we're going to look at to calculate the dimension of this problem is we'll find the maximum number, or it's like the largest, smallest number of planes that would have to be involved to find an empty intersection. All right, so how do we do that? Well, it's not so difficult once you, you know, get the idea, right? Um, which is that if we have sort of a picture here, right? I'll draw a picture in this quadrant down here. So imagine we have plane here, plane here. And we keep adding them in. Maybe, so here would be like the region. This is all intersecting them. And then at some point, we're going to add in another region out here. And when we intersect this whole region with this last plane, then what we're going to end up with is a completely empty region. All right? But if we look at this whole thing, then we could actually ignore this other chunk of the whole system. We could just look at this vertex by itself. And so if we can ever find a pair of lines which intersect in a point, then if we test that last point against this next half space and it doesn't happen to be contained in it, then we would know that this vertex is empty. So there's going to be the intersection of these three half spaces will be empty, and therefore the intersection of all the half spaces will be empty. All right? So the conclusion of this all right, is that um, you have the following result, which is called Halley's theorem. It's actually more general, so we're going to call this sort of a weak version. All right, the more general version applies to arbitrary convex sets, not just half spaces. We'll say if a linear program is infeasible, then there exists d plus 1 half spaces. Uh, let's call these h, or actually uh, we'll call it uppercase v contained in s, uh, such that uh, intersection of all vi in v is empty. So it better be exactly d plus 1. That's the key point here. So why is this true? Well, we already kind of sketched out the proof here. So the first point is that if there is some d plus 1 tuple, all right, then it intersects as an empty set, then obviously s is going to be empty because the, uh, the region determined by s is the intersection of all of these half spaces. So if you intersect the empty set with anything, you get the empty set back. So that's simple. But the key thing is showing that there are no more than d plus 1 half spaces. And the proof for this, which I won't go through in detail, is similar to this little picture that I drew down here. So we can imagine inserting the half spaces incrementally. So at some point, we're going to start from the entire plane. And as we add a half space, we're going to trim that plane by that half space. So I'll just walk through the picture again. So we start out. We take one plane, we cut this whole space into two chunks, and then we have like maybe this region left. Take another plane, now we have this you know, wedge. Take another plane, this is left, 
take another plane. Now we're stuck with this polygon. And then eventually, if the thing is infeasible, some have space is going to come along, and it's going to cut away all that's left. And so we'll transition from a point where we had stuff that was left here versus stuff that uh, was gone. Right. So that's when we trim it against this last half space. So all we have to do is take one of the vertices of this polygon, right, which is going to be formed by the meet of two lines. And then we intersect that meet with the half space over here. And so we can just take whenever, whatever vertex you like intersected with this half space. That gives us a tuple of d plus 1 uh, half spaces whose intersection is empty. So that's the easy version of Helly's theorem, uh, proved in a fairly simple way. Right? OK, so the conclusion of this, right, or the corollary, so the corollary is that the combinatorial dimension of linear programming is D. Uh, I think I probably wrote it a little bit wrong. It should actually be if it requires D plus one thing. So it's sort of similar to how like rank is actually one higher than dimension. So I think the definition I wrote there was actually for combinatorial rank earlier. So I may have made a typo with that. But the conclusion, though, is that we never need to look at more than D plus one things. And I think you subtract the last one, then you end up with just D. So that's the idea there. So you're saying specifically if it's feasible, right? Or yeah, if it's feasible, the, the combinatorial dimension is D. If it's infeasible, you have to check at most D plus one things to certify that it's infeasible. So a sort of shortcut for how you can think about combinatorial dimension is that if there's sort of uh, D plus one elements that certifies that this thing is not feasible, then the dimension is D. And actually, that's going to be true for most of the problems that we're going to look at today. So OK. So that's the first example of uh, an LP type problem. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. Now, how do you solve LP type problems? Well, it turns out Seidel's algorithm can actually be adapted pretty straightforwardly to solve LP type problems. Um, and I'll just walk through this really quick. So we already saw this algorithm yesterday. It's pretty straightforward. And we did uh, a basic analysis of it, which carries through to LP type problems. So the running time constants and uh, will, the constants will be different, but the asymptotic behavior is exactly identical to what we concluded last time. So if we recall, Seidel's algorithm looks like this. Uh, we'll call it Seidel LP. And our arguments here is we're going to take our set S for the LP type problem and our function f. And because it's a recursive uh, function where we're going to be projecting onto tinier subspaces, we're going to have an extra argument, which we'll just call x, that is the uh, set of half spaces which we're currently looking at. So I'll think of that as like the active set of the constraints. So one way we can write this algorithm out is that we'll say, OK, uh, initialize this set R to empty set. Uh, we'll set this other thing b to x. And then uh, what we're going to do is shuffle or we'll set s prime to a shuffled version of there. So remember, this was the Fisher-Yates algorithm that we saw. So we'll do shuffle s. Then for every constraint h in this shuffled S. Uh, we'll say if f of b is not equal to f of b union h, then recursively update b using this extra constraint. So we'll set b equal to Seidel LP of uh, R, which is actually the set of constraints processed so far. 
F and then B union H. And then we'll just set R to And then when we're all done, you just return x, or return b, right? Now there's a couple of tricks here. So one of them is that if you remember when we're iterating through them, you have to filter out redundant constraints. So we can do this in an LP type problem uh, with the following procedure, which is we just go through and then check which of the constraints can be removed from this set without changing the value. So we have this remove redundant constraints. And then we have this predicate here, right? which is the thing that we have to check continuously, which we can say is, OK, if we add an additional constraint to this problem, does it change our solution? So we'll call this thing uh, a violation test. So the idea. Uh, is basically we're going to check if after we add the constraint h, anything changes. And so an alternate way that we can specify an LP-type problem is that we can actually just give a function that computes this predicate and this uh, basis reduction here. And so if we have those two ingredients, then you can actually implement Seidel's algorithm just in terms of calls to those subroutines. Right? So what do these look like? So the first is this predicate, right? We're going to call it violate B and H. And all that this does is just say test if F of B equals F of B union H, or if it's not equal. So basically, uh, one of the constraints in our problem, we'll think of it as being violated by this, uh, or we'll think of like our current solution, our f of b, as being violated by the constraint h, if when we add it here, it updates this in any way. The second is uh, this little gadget here, right, which we're going to think of as a basis reduction. Right, so we know how uh, to find a basis in one sense, which is you can just go through your vectors and throw out the ones which are you know, linearly dependent until you're all done. And so this is uh, a function that we're going to call basis. And we're just going to give it some set uh, b as input. And we'll just say throw out elements in B until uh, B set minus X is not equal to F of B. So you just keep tossing out elements in B until it's as small as you can possibly make it. So it's somewhat straightforward. Right? So that's the idea. And so given this little gadget, what this lets us do is verify that every time we call F, in this violation test or in this basis test, the cardinality of the set B that we're going to look at will never be greater than the combinatorial dimension of the problem, which in the case of linear programming will always be at most D. All right, so how do we implement uh, a version of F that can be evaluated for at most D elements at a time? Because if we have that, then we could implement this violate predicate or this basis predicate. Or alternatively, we could just directly implement those two things. Well, the answer is that in the case where we have at most d linear constraints, then the problem that we have to solve is basically a linear uh, inverse. So it's just you know solve a, a matrix problem. All right. So what does that look like? And how am I doing for time? All right. I'm good. Okay. So. All right, so what does f look like for matrices? So this is all good. I mean, we saw this yesterday. This is just a different way of writing the same function. All right. So for a linear program, we only have to compute f for at most d elements at a time. 
So we'll write it like this. We'll say f of x. We're going to think of, you know, x is at most d half spaces. At most d plus 1 half spaces in some sense. Uh, yeah. Most d plus 1 half spaces. At most d. Right. Most d. Yes. At most d half spaces is a basis. So we'll think uh, that this set f of x is uh, a basis, or x is a basis, and what we're going to do is check if x has any violations in it. So in other words, uh, we're going to just solve the linear program for d planes. All right. In a sense, all that we have to do is um, say, first compute the meet of x, which is going to just be um, x0, meet x1, meet x2. So thinking of them as just like half spaces. So we just meet all of them. Then uh, project, let's call this whole thing uh, x star. Project c onto x star. And this operation here is basically uh, equivalent to solving a matrix. Right, so that's all that's going on in linear programming when we call f. So, OK, great. We have succeeded in creating a formulation of linear programming, which is at least equivalent, functionally speaking, to what we already had before. So in order for this generalization to be substantial or meaningful in any way, uh, we would hope that we can start taking on some problems which are not examples of simple linear programs. So. I'm going to go through a couple of these uh, somewhat quickly. Um, and the basic idea in each of them is going to be relatively similar. We're just going to try to uh, write some function of this form where we can take some finite set of our constraints and then project it to the finite or to some value or vertex. So here is the first of these which is a very uh, direct generalization of linear programming called quadratic programming. So the first example of an LP type problem that's not linear programming is a quadratic program. And so a quadratic program looks like this. I want to minimize. Uh, the set of all x in, say, Rn, such that x transpose qx plus c transpose x is our objective function. And we have the constraint um, that some matrix Ax is less than or equal to b. Uh, again, we'll think of each of these constraints as being uh, one of the elements of our set. So we can think of each row of this matrix as basically being one constraint. Um, and our function f here uh, just involves projecting points onto uh, ellipsoidal isosurfaces. So here's sort of a picture of what's going on. Uh, so imagine if we have a quadratic here, right? Oh, so we have the additional constraint that q is positive semi-definite. which basically means that the isosurfaces generated by Q are going to be ellipses. So the way to think about that is that if you just say for, for all x, x transpose Qx is greater than or equal to 0. So that's a scalar, right, because it's basically like a dot product. Um, and so visually, what we have here 
is that there is some point which is the uh, you know minimizer of this whole function. So we can think of this as being the vertex of the ellipse, or like the center. So we'll think of this as like being a x naught, and then we have these rays, or these like ellipses that propagate out, and then the uh, the foci of these ellipses or their axes are just going to be the eigenvectors of Q. So we'll think of this as being you know, some eigenvector uh, E1. It's going to have some value lambda 1. This will be lambda 2, E2. So this is the mental picture of what's going on. And if we have a polytope here, like some half space, then at some point, one of these iso lines will touch this ellipse, or will touch this half space right here. And then this point becomes the minimizer. So the idea is that we're going to just take the center of this ellipse and then project it onto these half spaces uh, iteratively in order to construct the minimum. Uh, and algebraically, what this amounts to do uh, to doing at the end of the day is just applying uh, is just solving a linear system, right? So if we have some set of uh, half spaces which happen to be under constrained, then we're just going to check that the vertex or the center of this like ellipse is you know, satisfied, or if not, then we project onto the lower dimensional constraint, and then just recurse until uh, it converges. Uh, quadratic programming uh, has a lot of applications. Uh, one example of a quadratic program is point distance. Uh, so we saw how you could write out a distance computation for points written as vertex polytopes uh, yesterday. But you can also do the same trick for half spaces pretty easily. So there's a simple one. I'll just say minimize these points x and y such that x minus y transpose. This is the thing we want to minimize, subject to the constraint. Um, call it ax less than or equal to b. Uh, Cy less than or equal to d. All right, so these would be two h polytopes, and then uh, we just want to find the closest pair of points between them. So pretty directly translatable into a quadratic program. Uh, the vertex one, we have to basically do the same game that we went through yesterday, where you would have to solve for the coefficients and barycentric coordinates of the closest pair of points. But it's the uh, same basic idea, right? Yeah. How is this one a quadratic program and the other one a linear program? No, the other one was a quadratic program, too. Okay. Well, the, well the, the thing that I did on Tuesday was I actually did it for affine subspaces. And if you write it out for affine subspaces, at the end you see that it's basically a linear system, or it's basically a linear least squares problem. And then you can solve it by taking a derivative and then setting it equal to 0. So you have a positive semi-definite quadratic. Yeah, so... So generally, if you have a positive semi-definite quadratic and you want to minimize it, then computing the minimum of this thing is basically the same problem as finding the vertex of this ellipse. And the way you do this is you just take a derivative of this thing, because it's going to be the unique solution to you know, this whole thing equals 0, right? so when you take the derivative. And when you do that, you'll end up with something that looks like 2qx plus c equals uh, 0. You move the c to the other side, and then you multiply by q inverse. And now, basically, Q inverse C gives you the vertex, which is the minimum of the quadratic program. And if you add in some additional constraints, up to D of them, as linear constraints, then they will just show up as Lagrange multipliers, essentially, in this equation. And so you'll have these extra variables. We'll see something very similar to this, actually. In fact, let's just do that next. So the other related LP-type problem, which is very similar. And you can actually formulate it as quadratic programming, but it's more efficient and direct to do it just as an LP-type problem, is finding the minimal enclosing ball for a set of points. So uh, this would be pretty useful if you have some computer graphics-type application, and maybe it's really good at filtering out by spheres, and you have like a bunch of meshes, and you would like to approximate all of them by spheres, so then your you know, geometry culling algorithm can quickly sweep them out. Or you know, maybe you can use them as part of some other you know, higher level sphere-based filtering system. Or maybe you just like approximating things by spheres, because spheres are aesthetically pleasing for some purpose or another. I don't know. All right. So we'll talk about this problem called a minimal enclosing ball. 
which is yet another LP type problem. Um, so here is the idea. Minimal enclosing ball. Or disk, sometimes, if you're talking about points in the plane. So the concept here is given uh, S contained in Rd uh, points. Solve this problem, where we want to minimize R, uh, where we have this variable R and C, such that uh, for all P sub I in this set S, uh, P minus C uh, quantity squared is less than or equal to R squared. So they're all contained in some disk. That's the issue. Um, so that's the high level problem. But we can solve this problem exactly if we have a tuple of at most d plus 1 points. That is a simplex. So here is the easy version of this problem, right? where we'll basically just consider only a finite set of points. So easy version. is that the cardinality of S is equal to d plus 1. That is, it's a simplex. So in 2D, it will look like a triangle. So these points, p0, p1, p2. Then from high school geometry, we know that the smallest enclosing circle here is just the circle whose center is the circumcenter of this set of points. So that is, we're going to have this point C, which is the circumcenter. And then we have these lengths here, which are all equal. All right, so that's the idea. And we would now like to generalize this idea of a circumcenter to higher dimensions. So maybe 3D or 4D or you know, some other space. And if it's not in lateral triangle? This doesn't have to. It only happens to look vaguely equilateral. But these lengths will always be equal. The circumcenter, though, might not lie inside the triangle itself. Right? It could be outside of the triangle. All right, but uh, it will always be, uh, there is always one point which satisfies the condition that all of these lengths are equal. All right? Yeah, exactly. So, in fact, this is actually how we could think about solving this minimal enclosing ball by brute force, which is we can just enumerate all points on the boundary and then just look at all d plus 1 tuples of them. And then one of those things, or it might actually be like a two tuple if it's you know sort of a degenerate configuration. But we can just look at all you know tuples up to d plus one points, which happen to lie on the convex hull of the point set. And then at least one of those things is going to determine a minimal enclosing ball. I mean, similarly, if we had two points, we could do this in a sort of degenerate version here too. So we don't have to have exactly d, right? But we could have fewer than them. So if you have p zero, p one, then we just take this, you know. Uh, angle by or this perpendicular bisector, the center point, midpoint between the two lines, and then that would be the circumcenter of this two simplex. But this algorithm will work for any number of points and in any dimension uh, at first, right? So uh, one way to think about this is that we want to basically set all of these lengths equal to one another, or we can also think about this parameter c as minimizing the distance to all uh, sets of points. So we can think of this problem as a finite or a, a, a simple uh, you know, linearly squares type problem, where you have this parameter alpha in barycentric coordinates. So we're going to think of alpha as basically representing the barycentric coordinates of p. So this will be an r d plus 1. And what we want to do is minimize p alpha transpose p alpha. So p alpha is equal to c, right? So because this is basically just you know taking the barycentric coordinates for c and then uh, expanding it out as like a, a convex combination of the vertices of the triangle. And in order for this to actually be a convex combination, we have to add this constraint 
uh, that the sum of all of these alphas has to be equal to 1. So we're working in affine coordinates right now, right? just to simplify this a bit. So OK, this is a linear least squares problem. Uh, we can just take this constraint, turn it into a Lagrange multiplier by sticking a lambda on it. Right? So we subtract 1 from both sides, multiply it by lambda, move it up there, and simplify it all. And what we end up with is a linear system that looks like uh, P transpose P times alpha plus our Lagrange multiplier lambda is equal to P P transpose. And uh, the sum of these alpha is equal to 1, which is a linear system. So if we write this whole system in matrix form, uh, this just becomes, you know, solve the matrix P transpose P, 1, 1, 0, alpha, lambda, that whole thing equals uh, P, P transpose 1. All right, so if we just invert that matrix or you know, just do a solve for alpha and lambda, that gives us our barycentric coordinates. And so we can find the circumcenter by, again, just solve a linear system. All right. So with that, uh, we could basically take Seidel's algorithm or whatever uh, LP type algorithm solver we would like. And we can compute the minimal enclosing ball of a set of points. Now, the key thing, though, is that in order to get a violation here, we would actually need d plus 2 points, because we'd have to have these points, which would form a ball, plus a fourth point, which would be outside the triangle or outside the sphere of them. So the combinatorial dimension of the minimal enclosing ball problem in d dimensions is actually d plus 1 dimensional. So that's one small subtlety there. So we have to actually go up like one higher dimension when we want to do uh, LP type problems. Uh, Similarly, you can actually construct a minimal enclosing ellipse uh, by a similar type of argument. Uh, and if you want to think about why this is actually d plus 1 dimensional, let me say what's going on here, right? Is that normally in linear programming, we're really just solving for this parameter c, right? Or we're basically computing a point. But here we have this extra parameter r. So we actually have you know, uh, d plus 1 extra parameter for r variables in this problem that we're solving for. And so it makes sense that the combinatorial dimension is going to be one higher than we would get in linear programming. Uh, and so a variation of this is we could try to find the minimal enclosing ellipsoid. And if we do that, the combinatorial dimension will be uh, d times d plus 3 over 2, which is we have to solve for all of the additional variables of the minimal enclosing ellipsoid. So uh, we'll say similar story for minimal ellipsoid, uh, we end up with basically d times d plus 3 over 2 dimension. All right, so yeah, it gets a little bit, not over d, over 2. All right, so it starts to get a little bit dicey as we go into higher dimensions, a lot of these problems, because uh, Seidel's algorithm gives us pretty good performance in n. But here, the d can start to get a little bit big. And so d factorial might be fine for 2D or 3D linear programming problems. But when we start moving to things where we need to do like you know, 6, 7, or 8D, that d factorial becomes pretty killer. So we would like to get away from that d factorial term and maybe look at some other alternatives for doing linear programming. And that's what I'm going to go over with the time that I have left in class right now. So uh, we'll see next uh, an algorithm that has much better scaling as a function of d than the previous algorithm. And this was actually one of two different algorithms developed by Ken Clarkson. Oh, I should also say one other thing, too. Um, yeah, there's one other important example of an LP type problem, which you see frequently, which is integer programming. So integer programming in general is an NP-hard problem. But in finite dimensions, it can be formulated as an LP-type problem of 2 to the d combinatorial dimension. So 2 to the d combinatorial dimension. 
which means that integer programming in 3D and in 2D is actually quite tractable. Uh, you can actually solve these problems if you only have a small number of integer variables that need to be optimized using one of these LP type algorithms that uh, we'll see. All right, so you can even do uh, this stuff. I, I won't go into the details of that right now. Uh, OK. So yeah, so this is Clarkson's algorithm. So Clarkson actually invented a lot of algorithms in one paper for solving LP-type problems. And actually, he pretty much introduced the concept of an LP-type problem. Uh, I mean, without explicitly sort of defining it. But the idea is pretty much there. It was later sharpened up uh, by uh, Scherer and uh, uh, Wenzel and uh, subsequent work. And we'll talk about their algorithms for solving LP-type problems as well. Quick question. Yeah. Um, we kind of discussed uh, a while ago how for linear programs we have like number of constraints and dimensions high or, or, or sorry, when they're like around the same for constraints and dimensions and then the case when one mode is higher than the other. Mm -hmm. Are we falling this into that flatter category? Or the so we're, we're, mostly, we're mostly thinking, um, so there's sort of a duality in regular linear programming between number of constraints and the dimension. And so usually if there's like a huge gap between one of those two variables, then you can always turn it into the dual form, and then you can just work in that setting. Yeah, so, yeah. But I was asking whether it was between um, when they're the same or when they're far apart. Um, so when they get really far apart, right, if the, if the gap becomes very large, then you can always think of it as either being like the dimension is very low and the number of constraints is Sorry, very so high. What I meant was like for this algorithm, which category is Oh, these algorithms are all in the category where the dimension is very low. So okay. I should actually say this, that LP-type problems are generally only applied to low-dimensional linear programming problems. You can think of them as a combinatorial version of low-dimensional linear programming. In fact, all low-dimensional linear programming algorithms can be thought of as LP-type algorithms, or at least all of the efficient algorithms which are known. The other thing that all these algorithms all have in common is that they're all randomized algorithms. So Seidel's algorithm uh, is also a randomized algorithm. Clarkson's linear programming algorithms are all randomized. And the algorithm, which we'll probably get to at the end of class, uh, which is by Matuszek, Scherer, and Wenzel, uh, whose names I'm probably butchering, um, is also randomized. So OK. Um, Right, so here's the first of Clarkson's algorithms. And there's going to be some funny constants in here, which unfortunately I'm not going to be able to explain adequately. But you're just going to have to take my word for it that this actually does make sense. So here's the idea. Um, so Clarkson LP. So there, there are two algorithms that Clarkson defines. The first one is a recursive algorithm. And then the second is an iterative algorithm. And then there's a third algorithm which combines the two of them, plus Seidel's algorithm. So, uh, and then he also had a fourth algorithm for integer programming, but we're not going to worry about that one today. So, all right. So here's the we're going to call it Clarkson LP rec for recursive. So this is his recursive algorithm for linear programming, and we're going to take as input some LP-type problems specified by S and F. Although in practice, we're actually only going to call uh, the violate and basis function. So here is the idea. So first, we'll say if the cardinality of S is less than or equal to 9 times the dimension squared, all right, so this is the combinatorial dimension, then we're just going to run some simple thing like Seidel's algorithm, whatever, or you can use simplex method because it's small enough that we can just brute force it. So we'll just run Seidel uh, on it. All right. All right. So otherwise, we're going to create this new set called V, which is the set of violated constraints so far. And then we'll go in a loop. Um, so first order of business is to select a random subset of size d square root of n. So we'll say set r equal to random subset of uh, s uh, set minus 
v such that uh, of size d square root of n. I'll explain how to do this in a moment. Um, then we're going to recursively solve this. So we'll just call Clarkson uh, recursive LP again. So we'll, and we're going to do it on the basis set. So we'll have to do this basis thing. All right, no, we won't run on basis, right? We're going to run it on R union V. So we're going to keep all of these Vs here and then just union it with R and feed in the parameter F. So it's the new version. Right. Okay. All right. Then we're going to construct all of the constraints which are left in S that happen to violate uh, this new solution X. So we're going to use the violate predicate. Right? So we'll basically say uh, this is going to be the collection of all H in S such that violate X Right? And then we'll say if the cardinality of V prime is uh, greater than 2 times the square root of n, we're just going to continue. So skip it, do nothing. If V is empty, so we got no other elements, then we're basically done. We'll just return x. Otherwise, uh, we're going to update v and loop. So we'll set v is equal to v union v prime. And then just continue. So I believe, yeah, that's the idea. So OK, pretty simple to write, but it's a little bit confusing what's going on here at first. So to break it down, and I'm not going to actually prove this in detail, but I'll present sort of an, a sketch of a proof, right? Uh, which will basically depend on three different facts, which are independently somewhat tough to get through. But the idea, once we have these things, will be straightforward, right? And for the details of how to prove them, you can look at Clarkson's paper. So here's the, the first point, is that uh, we have three Three lemmas. So the idea is this. So, so this is fact one. Or I'll write it over here. And it pertains to this line. So we'll say if V prime equals empty set or actually to this line down here. It's probably the better one to tie it to. Right? So if v prime is not equal to empty set, then v prime contains at least one element from the basis of S. That is, uh, V prime intersect basis of S is not equal to the empty set. All right. So what this means is that every time we loop through this iteration, if we get down to this point, then we're going to be adding at least one new constraint to the basis set. So we're going to be making some progress over there. All right. Um, OK, so uh, to give you some idea of why you should believe that this is true, is that uh, when we construct this point x here, right, which is our current 
uh, guess at the solution. So you can think of this as the solution after we've you know, basically restricted down to this set of constraints R, plus all of the constraints that we know happen to satisfy this solution. Then we're going to go through and then check any constraints which happen to violate it. And so if there is any constraint that violates this S, then it's also going to be one of our solution uh, set. Right? So the basis of S is, in a sense, what we're trying to find. That's the solution. Right? So we'll basically uh, say that we're always going to pull out at least one of them when we do this loop through all of the planes here. Right? Um, the second statement, and this one is actually the hardest part to prove, and so I'm going to just kind of punt on it a little bit. Um, is that the expected size of R union V prime, or no, the expected size of this thing, right? So expected size, so this is our second unproven but assertion. The expected size of R union V is about 9 time, or it's about the square root of 9 d squared n. All right, this is the idea. So basically, it'll end up being about d square root of n. So another way to think of this is that this is order d square root of n. Uh, proving this requires some pretty detailed analysis. And this is actually like where most of the paper is spent, is establishing this particular lemma. And we're not going to do it right now. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last point is that the probability of uh, this loop completing is greater than 1 half. So the third lemma is that the probability of success Right, so that we don't have to you know, do a retry. Right? So suppose that the set was like way too big, right? is greater than 1 over 2. Right, so this is the idea. Is that most of the time when we do this, the set of violating constraints is going to be relatively small compared to the you know, total number of constraints. So with these three points, I claim that we can actually come up with a running time for this algorithm, which is that each time we're going to run another, so we have this outer loop. But this outer loop, because of this condition here, right, that it's always going to, that it'll only be executed, or that it'll only get stuck, you know, maybe less than half the time, right, uh, combined with the fact that every time it runs some cycle of this loop, we're going to add an additional constraint to the basis, means that in order d times n iterations, or so in order d iterations of this loop, we will be done. And how much work do we do on this thing? Well, we have to do uh, you know, some function of d number of like constant operations to do this violation test, which is relatively cheap. Uh, but computing all of these violators just requires a scan through the planes. So that's an order n operation. So the outermost loop of this whole thing only requires order d times n plus the number of these recursive calls. And so if we iterate this down, we'll end up with something that runs on the order of d uh, log n, right? Because each time we cut it down here, we're going to move to square root of n uh, additional points, right? So we'll have basically order d n plus a d log n factor, which is an additive plus, right? So we'll end up running in basically order d n plus some really nasty constant in d, right? So that's the, the first high level algorithm. And. I have 10 minutes left, which is not really enough time. So I'm just going to write out how the iterative algorithm works. So um, the basic problem that you run into here is that if you do this whole analysis with the, this violate test, you see that this requires like uh, order d squared n calculations if we run this whole thing at the end down here. So we end up with this rather nasty constant for the extra terms that are left. So to get rid of those and shrink them down, Clarkson invented another algorithm, which is an iterative uh, LP solver. And it uses similar types of results. So so there's an iterative version of this. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't say how you select the uh, subset either, right? So that was one thing that was not explained. 
So that might actually be useful to uh, go through really quick, too. Um, yeah, so does everyone here know how to draw a random set of k items from an array of n items in linear time? Right? Because we need to be able to do that in order for this algorithm to actually run in order n. Right? So, all right, here's the short answer Fisher Yates shuffle. Right? You just take all of the items in the array, you can just do that shuffle on them, and then take the first k of them. So that's how you get that result. OK. Everyone follow that idea? All right. Conceptually pretty simple. That's called reservoir sampling for people who do like streaming stuff. It's not a very difficult algorithm. Um, right. So the next variation of this. OK. So we have an iterative version of this. Right? And so uh, the iterative version uh, uses uh, a sort of technique where weights are going to be assigned to each of these constraints. So we're going to imagine that for every constraint in our set S, we're going to have some weight associated with it. And then we're going to generate our subsets using these weights, which we have generated adaptively. And then every iteration will update the weights. And so uh, as we you know, uh, churn through the constraints, the weights are going to become uh, higher for the constraints which are more likely to be in the basis, and then lower for the uh, constraints which are less likely to be in the basis. So this is sort of the, uh, the high-level concept. So the way that we're going to model these weights is that they're going to be a set of counters, one for each of the constraints. And we're going to initialize them all to one. And then every time we make a pass through this array, we're going to double the uh, uh, weight for whatever you know, constraint we happen to hit. All right, so here's the basic idea. So um, we'll just say initialize weights to 1. So this is the first idea. So we're going to have these weights of w of h, right? So for each, for each h inside s, we have some weight value w. We'll just set it equal to 1. And again, we have this base case where if the size of s is less than or equal to uh, 9d squared, then we'll just run Seidel's algorithm. All right. All right. So otherwise, here's what we're going to do. So we'll basically have this while true. So. Again, we're going to generate a random set R as before. So we'll find this like random test set of planes. Except uh, we're going to fix the size of R to be exactly 9d squared. So uh, this will be a random set of 9d squared uh, constraints. And then most importantly, weighted by w. All right, so we want to basically draw them with a probability that's going to be proportional. So uh, the, you know, the probability of some constraint h is going to be proportional to the weight of h divided by the total weight in s. So we want to draw these things you know, from some non-uniform distribution. And so here's the, the next step. So basically, given the set R, we will basically we will solve for some initial basis solution uh, using uh, whatever, some finite thing, right? Because we only have 9d squared of these constraints. We can just use like Seidel's algorithm or some other simple like deterministic thing, because it's a finite size set. We'll just run Seidel's algorithm. doesn't matter. Uh, uh, R. Now, we'll set v to be the collection of all constraints again that violate uh, x. So we'll make another call to this violate subroutine here. And now we're pretty much almost done with this thing. So we'll say if uh, the weight of v is less than or equal to 2 times the weight of s over 
9d minus 1. I don't think it's 9d squared. And I'll say, OK, uh, basically uh, multiply all of the constraints in w by 2. Otherwise, if uh, this random set R that we happen to draw was actually the correct and final solution, so we'll say else if V equals 0, right? So in other words, there were no violations, then we're actually finished, right? Because X was the solution. So then we'll just return X. And that's it. That's the whole algorithm right there. Or if V equals empty set. So. Uh, yeah, there's only three minutes left in class. I can't explain exactly why this works, right? Um, but the argument is similar to the last uh, algorithm. So basically, each time uh, we do some iteration over here, again, we're going to have a probability of success that will be greater than 1 over 2. And every one of these Vs that we select will contain at least one of the uh, constraints which will uh, be contained in the final basis set. And when we do that, we're going to basically double the weights on those basis constraint elements. And we'll just keep doing that until eventually the probability of drawing the basis elements is just overwhelming. And then every time we go through this, when we select R, we're going to get the basis elements. So OK, it's fine. Um, so how do we get? this random set with weights on it. This is actually a little bit harder, right? So we know how we can use the Fisher-Yates shuffle to just take the first k you know, elements or like a random k subset. Uh, but here we need to be a little bit uh, more subtle with how we construct these elements inside our uh, set. Uh, but it turns out you can use a pretty simple algorithm with just a heap to construct uh, a weighted sampling from a set of these elements. So here's the idea. So I, it's not an order uh, n plus k time algorithm, but it will end up being order n plus k log k, right? Or it'll actually be order n log k is the complexity. So it's not quite as good, uh, which is actually unfortunate. I wish I knew a way to do it in linear time, but I don't. Right? I only know a way to do it in order uh, n log k, but because this is not you know, particularly important constant in this term, we can still get by doing that. So here's the idea. Um, I'm going to erase this. Just say how to do weighted reservoir sampling. So here's the really simple weighted reservoir sampling algorithm. Uh, reservoir sampling in order n log k plus k or whatever. Right? k factor is strictly less than n. So how does this work? OK. Uh, say sample. We'll give it some array of s and array weights w. Initialize, uh, let's call this thing t for heap. All right, say for i equal 1 to n. Yeah. Sure. All right. All right, try one of these blue ones. OK. So for i equal 1 to n, uh, we'll basically set uh, this parameter alpha, which is going to be a random number between 0 and 1, raised to the w of h or w of s sub i, right? So just raise it to the weight of i's power. And then we'll just do t dot push uh, the pair alpha to h sub i, then pop off 
And then we'll just go pop the oldest, old weightest thing. So we'll say if the length of t uh, is greater than k, t dot pop. So that's the idea. So you just have this heap of your top k items, and then we just use this sort of funky little function here where we just roll a random bare die between 0 and 1, and then we exponent it to the weight of the element that we want to select. Then uh, the way you can think of this is that you're just taking these uniform values and then you're sorting them. Um, yeah, And I think I'm over time right now. So that's the algorithm. It's pretty simple. Uh, you can kind of stare at it for a little bit and figure out what's going on. But, or you can ask me after class. <laughs>